Hi guys, um, I'm Kelsey from Salt Church. I'm going to be reading from Jeremiah 20 for you guys. Um, I'm also reading from the ESV version. So Jeremiah 20. Now Peshur the priest, son, the son of Immer, who was the chief officer in the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. Then Peshur beat Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate of the house of the Lord. The next day, when Peshur released Jeremiah from the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, The Lord does not call your name Peshur, but terror on every side. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will make... I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. They shall fall by the sword of their enemies while you look on. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon. He shall carry them captive to Babylon and shall strike them down with the sword. Moreover, I will give all the wealth of the city, all its gains, all its prized belongings, and all the treasures of the kings of Judah into the hand of their enemies, who shall plunder them and seize them and carry them into Babylon." And you, Peshur, and all those, and all who dwell in your house shall go into captivity. To Babylon you shall go, and there you shall die, and there you shall be buried, you and all your friends, to whom have pro prophesied falsely. O Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is a fire, there is, a, <laughs> there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. Denounce him, let us denounce him. Say all my close friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived, then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as I dread warrior. Therefore my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their external dishonour will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, who test the righteous who sees the heart and the mind. Let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of the evildoers. Cursed be the day on which I was born, the day when my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. Cursed be the men who brought news to my father, a son is born to you, making him very glad. Let that man be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without pity. Let them hear a cry in the morning and an alarm at noon, because he did not kill me in the womb. So my mother would have been my grave and her womb forever great. Why did I come out from the womb to toil, to see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? I think you could do reasonable justice to the book of Jeremiah in about 10 sermons in a series. So I'm doing injustice to it in about four sermons. And we jump to this very sobering chapter, chapter 20. Uh, obviously, I don't know how your church or your ministry is going. But maybe just compare it with this. A ministry where you face constant criticism and pretty well zero encouragement. Where year after year you experience loneliness, isolation and ridicule. You've had multiple imprisonments, torture and death threats. You've been cast into the bottom of a miry pit. 
your brilliant published sermons have been burnt. Now, I fully realise that's probably not as bad as being an FIEC pastor. <laughs> but it's pretty ordinary, isn't it? John Calvin said that the Psalms are a window into the soul. And in Jeremiah 20, which is pretty much from verse 7 onwards, a psalm of lament, uh, we have a window into Jeremiah's soul. This is not the only time he opens up. He's, he's pretty good at opening up. Um, particularly from chapter 11 onwards, you have what are known as the confessions of Jeremiah. And, and that phrase, I don't really know why they use it. He's not confessing his sin. He's basically confessing that his ministry sucks. Um, he, he pours out the grief and the anguish of the ministry that God has called him to. I have this image uh, in my head. I kind of like you to have it in your head as we work our way through this. Imagine you're, you're walking through a, you know, a really dark uh, forest area and uh, in there you stumble across this old shack, um, just a dilapidated hut, and it's, it's crumbling and broken down and there's one little window and you peer through this window into the dark, gloomy space inside and there you see a man, a man on the floor writhing in pain. He's crying out with all his heart to God. Who are we looking at? Jeremiah, for sure. But also, we could be looking through that little window at Jesus. Or perhaps it could be you or me in there. I think as, as we look at Jeremiah chapter 20, we need to think about all three. Jeremiah and what he experienced. Jesus and what he experienced. And then in the light of those two things, you and me and what we experience. Well, the chapter unfolds in four main sections and we're going to work our way through them. And the first thing that we see is a man bold in public. A man bold in public. As we now know, Jeremiah was given a horrible job description. His job was to preach a message of God's wrath and anger and coming judgment against his own people, against God's own people. And that meant Jeremiah preaching against his own people. And as we saw in chapter 1, God said, I'll make you tough for the job. I'll make you like an, an iron pillar, a bronze wall. I'll make you like a fortress, a bastion. And in these opening verses of Jeremiah chapter 20, once again, as many times in this book, you see Jeremiah tough as nails. In the previous two chapters, he's, he's taken a trip down to the potter's house. In chapter 18, he's seen a pot being made by the potter, and the potter screws it up, remolds it, starts again, and creates something else out of it. And it's a picture there of God in his sovereignty and his sovereign right being able to shape his people as he wants. And it's actually a picture of hope because it's the idea that God can, can munch us up and scrunch us up in judgment, and then remold us into something new and better. But then Jeremiah has another trip down to the potter's shop in chapter 19. And, and this time, it, it's a different picture in a different pot. Uh, not a pliable piece of clay, but a pot that's already been baked, and it's brittle. And God says, take that brittle, baked pot and smash it. 
And the big idea of Jeremiah's sermon that day was God will smash you. So pretty appealing sermon title, isn't it? You can imagine packaging a series around that. Uh, That'll bring him in. Uh, (laughs) Nah, even when he'd had the previous message, the people didn't like it. We're told in 1818, after the first trip down to the potter's shop, they said, come, let us make plots against Jeremiah, for the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come, let us strike him with the tongue, and let us not pay attention to any of his words. They didn't even like the nice sermon from the potter's shop. Man, they sure hated this one where the main message statement is God will smash you it's not the kind of sermon that you know people come away from and and shake your hand after and say oh nice nice sermon pastor thank you so much Pashur the temple priest didn't think it was a nice sermon at the beginning of chapter 20 (laughs) we read that when he heard what Jeremiah was prophesying Verse 2, he beat Jeremiah the prophet. That's probably 39 lashes. And put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate of the house of the Lord. (laughs) Sticks him in the temple stocks, uh, which is probably basically a rack, an implement of torture. Next day, Jeremiah is released. What does he do? He gets out there and he preaches to Peshur and his buddies and he just ramps up the message. Verse 3, the next day when Peshur released Jeremiah from the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, the Lord does not call your name Peshur, but terror on every side. But thus says the Lord, behold, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. And so he goes on. Peshur can mean fruitful on every side. Nice name. And he says, no, you're going to be terror on every side. And this is actually, in the next couple of verses, the first time that Jeremiah actually reveals that it's Babylon who will bring this judgment. Up until now in in the book, it's always been from the north. But now it's named. Babylon will come against you. And it will be a terror. It will be awful. You and your buddies, for sure, will be carted off into exile and come under the fierce judgment of God and experience great terror. Jeremiah's as bold as a lion, isn't he? It might remind you of Jesus, who called the religious leaders of his day whitewashed tombs, blind guides, vipers. Or it might remind you of the apostles who said to the religious leaders of their day, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight for us to obey you rather than God. But no way, guys. We can't help but speak what God has said to us. And you know, that's what God asks of all of us. To say what he has said, whether it's popular or not whether it's what people want to hear or not. Paul talks to Timothy, doesn't he, about a time coming when people will want to hear what their itching ears want to hear. And Timothy has to preach the word in season and out of season. I think we should expect fewer and fewer people to say, Nice sermon, Pastor. There might still be quite a bunch of people within our churches who will appreciate preaching on almost anything. But maybe even in our churches, there'll be fewer and fewer who say, nice sermon. Our message is seen as wrong and harmful. And we should expect to pay a price for speaking it. Many believers around the world today are doing exactly that. Uh, Open Doors estimates that in 2022, last year, 360 million Christians experienced, quote, high levels of persecution and discrimination. 
360 million Christians. I can't imagine that. That was 20 million more than in 2021. They estimate 5,600 Christians were murdered last year. 2,110 churches were attacked. It happens all over the world. I think we've still got it pretty darn good here in Australia. It could happen here. And if it does, you and I will need to keep being bold in public. And bold in public doesn't mean brash, and it doesn't mean nasty, and it doesn't mean just firing missiles at the world. It just means having the guts to say what God says, whether people want to hear it or not. So that's the first scene, uh, verses 1 to 6, bold in public. But then next, we see a completely different scene. It's as if now from out in the marketplace and in the temple courts where he's been preaching, Jeremiah now goes and hides in his little hut out in the woods in the dilapidated shed. And we peer through the window now and we see him grieved in private. We move from bold in public to grieved in private. I imagine you know that contrast, don't you? I I think sometimes people hear me uh, preach and they think, he's bold, he's like a lion. And then I go home and I tell you, my wife lives with a mouse. We, we have to stand up and speak and, and say it how it is and declare what God calls us to declare. But, oh, man, inside we can be feeling a thousand other things, can't we? Things we would scarcely dare admit. But the thing is, Jeremiah, Jeremiah admits them. He's, he's unbelievably frank and honest. Verse 7. Oh, Lord, you've deceived me. And I was deceived. You're stronger than I and you have prevailed. I've become a laughingstock all the day. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout violence and destruction for the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. In in that first phrase, you have deceived me, the 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 word he uses there has a whole range of shades of meaning from seduced, you've seduced me, to deceived, to duped, to overpowered, to persuaded. Look, whatever shade of meaning you go with, and the commentators argue over that, whatever way you go, the thing is, Jeremiah feels powerless, utterly powerless. God has led him into something, and God didn't actually dupe him. He told him up front, it's going to be flipping hard. I'm going to have to make you like a a bronze wall to cope with this thing. I'll steal you. But Jeremiah's saying, I had no idea. This is way harder than I ever imagined. It's tough as. God has led him into something, and now he can't get out of it. So he faces rejection and mocking and ridicule day after day. He's been put in the stocks, and he's become a laughing stock. He proclaimed to Peshur, terror on every side. And now all the people flick that round. If you look at verse 10, and they're all whispering, ah, terror on every side, denounce him, denounce him. Say, all my close friends, that's, that's who's against him. And oh, it's overwhelmingly painful for Jeremiah. He would love to stop preaching. He would so love to resign and get a real job. He's checking out. Seek.com. If I see jobs vacant. But he can't. He can't pull out. God. God's put a message in his heart and he's got to speak it. God touched his lips, remember, right at the start. Touched his mouth. Put his words in his mouth. He's got to speak this stuff. Verse 9, if I say I will not mention him or speak anymore, 
in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones. So if he, if he stops preaching it, the message burns in him. And if he preaches it, he gets burnt. Well, what do we make of this? Is, is Jeremiah just having a bad day? Another bad day? Feeling sorry for himself? Are, these, are we to read this just like his personal diaries and, and think, oh, the poor bloke? Clearly struggling with depression and anxiety, probably too much social media. Uh, are we meant to psychoanalyze him? Says his state of mind, recommend a counsellor. Actually, many commentators and preachers more or less go that way. But that ignores something significant here. This is not just Jeremiah talking back to God. These two are the words of God put into the mouth of Jeremiah. This chapter 2 is God's word to you, not just Jeremiah's words, to God. God is speaking these agonized words to us. You see, Jeremiah has ingested God's words. He talks in that language back in chapter 15 and verse 16 your words were found, and I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. He's eaten up God's word. And as he ate up and devoured and ingested God's word, the word became a part of him. He, he actually is called to a ministry where he has to embody the message. So back in chapter 16... He's told not to marry or have kids, not to go to funerals or grieve for loved ones, and not to go to parties and celebrate. <laughs> that's pretty miserable. Like, that's all the big stuff in the culture of his day, and he's not allowed to do any of it. Why not? Because he had to embody the realities that he was preaching. No marriage, no kids, to embody the ending of family bonds that would come with judgment and captivity. No funerals to embody no one grieving for God's people when they're carted off by the Babylonians. No parties to embody a day when there would be no joy or celebration whatsoever. In his very person, he represented the people he was preaching to and the message of judgment he was bringing to them. He was experiencing in his own being this wretched message that he was proclaiming. And yet, at the same time, as he embodied God's word, he was also experiencing not only what the people would experience, but he was experiencing what God experiences. The heartache of having to declare judgment against his own people. A God who wants to bless. A God who wants to bring life and build up. And God grieving over his people. Isn't one of the saddest verses of the Bible, that verse in Genesis chapter 6, where it says, the Lord was grieved that he had made man. God's heart broken over sin and wickedness. The agony of God of being rejected by his people. We saw that language in chapter 2. God feels like a husband who has the most adulterous wife. The grief of seeing his own people cut off from him because of their sin. Now, friends, when you, are, 
when you're struggling deeply with ministry and, and with, with the message that you have to bear and with people not being responsive and with dealing with another crisis and con- having to confront the ugliness of sin and, and you just don't want to go there anymore, when, when you're faced with all that, if I can put it this sort of bluntly and crudely, spare a thought for God. Spare a thought for God. He is more grieved than you are. In all his holiness, he is far more repulsed by sin than you or I ever are. In the depths of his love for his people, he's more hurt and wounded by their unfaithfulness and and their idolatry and their apostasy than we will ever be. This is the God who wants all people everywhere to be saved and come to a knowledge of his son. So Jeremiah lives this killing equation. He suffers as the representative of God's people under judgment. And he suffers as the representative of God in a world that hates him. Uh, Andrew Sheed opens up much of this idea in his book, A Mouthful of Fire. And he writes... No part of Scripture expresses with greater poignancy just how hard it is to stand between and represent both a holy God and a sinful humanity. And if that isn't triggering some biblical theology connections in your head, (laughs) there's trouble. There'll be terror on every side. Jeremiah had to embody it. Jesus incarnated it. He is the ultimate and true suffering prophet who for the truth that he spoke from a holy, loving, gracious, just, righteous God went to the cross. He had to stand in the gap between the humanity he represented and whose sins he bore and his own loving father whom he had to represent and whose wrath he had to bear. And he prayed, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Such was the suffering of Jesus. And when we bear his word, when he puts his word in our mouth, and when it starts to burn in our bones, we're going to experience a bit of this, at least. Jesus said to his disciples, didn't he, if they persecuted you, they'll persecute If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you too. The life of the Apostle Paul is almost a ceaseless testimony to the cost of speaking God's word. We cannot say all that God says and not suffer. Thankfully, we don't have to embody it in the way Jeremiah did. And we can't possibly incarnate it in the way that Jesus did. But when you speak for God in this world, you better expect that sometimes it will hurt. Hurt you and your family. And sometimes you'll want to bail. Oh, you'll want to bail. And then you'll feel, but I can't. How many times have I felt like that? I just want to get out of ministry. It's, t- it's too hard. I'm over it. I'm a firm believer in the disease of over <laughs> I, I often suffer from over I'm just over everything. Over. Over the struggle. Over the battle. Over the weariness. Over all the sin in my life and in other people's lives. Just over it. But I can't bail. 
There's a message that burns in my bones. It's so good. I know that the gospel is the only hope of the world. I know that Jesus is real and there's nothing better than preaching him. I have a love-hate relationship with preaching. Don't you? It's, it's one of the most beautiful and wonderful things I do. I seldom have greater highs than when I'm preaching. I seldom have greater lows than when I'm preaching or just after I've preached. It's agonizing. It's brilliant. It's joyful. It's wretched. I don't know. It's Jeremiah. <laughs> what do you do? What do you do when you feel like that? It's burning within. You can't give it up. We moan, don't we? I, I, well, look, I speak for myself, not for you. I moan. Uh, whinge to my wife. Sometimes whinge to friends. But what you've got to learn to do is whinge to God. Lament is a category in the Bible. And it's a category I think we need to rediscover. There's a time to grieve. There's a time to be as raw as Jeremiah, to just pour it all out. There's a time for blubbery, snotty, messy prayer before God. I say, Lord, I, I don't think I can take any more of this. This is, what, this is not what I signed up for. And yet somehow you won't let me out of it. Take it to God. Pour it out to him. Be as blunt and brutal and honest as you can possibly be because you won't shock him. He knows it already. We have, a, uh, we have the delight of a bunch of little grandkids. Most of them are, a bunch of them are around three or four. Heap of fun. We really enjoy them. Have them over home. My wife's job is to look after them and be kind and read them stories. And my job is to hype them up as high as possible. <laughs> And, you know, just pump them up, get them as high as guys. It's brilliant. But then, then there's that moment when they lose the plot completely. <laughs> oh, man, little kids can lose the plot, can't they? And that's the brilliant thing about being a grandparent. <laughs> because that's when you just say, it's time to go home. Back to mum and dad. And that's not actually a cop-out. That's the only solution. <laughs> at that moment we don't cut it only mum or dad cuts it and that's true in ministry only your dad in heaven cuts it you can whinge all you like to your elders your wife, your husband your friends and it's, it's okay to have a bit of a whinge. But you've got to go to God and pour out your heart to him and weep and plead and argue and complain. That's the category of lament. And God in his kindness gives it to us. He can take it. He's taken far more himself. So we've seen Jeremiah bold in public, grieved in private, and next we see him strong in God. Isn't that lovely? We see him strong in God. Imagine Jeremiah has taken himself off to the doctor. Uh, he's gone to the GP, not a regular GP. This is a physician of the soul. Uh, the doctor invites him in, take a seat. What's up, Jerry? How can I help you? And uh, Jerry explains that he feels spiritually dejected. He, he's been duped by God. He wants to resign from the prophetic office, but he can't. He feels trapped. He can't cope. He can't take it anymore. Ah, says the doctor, I know just, I know just the treatment. I know just the remedy for a crushed soul. He writes out a, pre, a threefold prescription for him, and it's there for us in verses 11 to 13. First, he says... Take heart in who God is. Take heart in who God is. That's the first thing, to start lifting your spirits again. And, and there's a brilliant phrase here that we need to get into our theological vocabulary. But the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. A dread warrior. That's a mighty 
fearsome, scary soldier. That's who God is, a determined, intimidating warrior. I don't usually see that many parallels between Arnie Schwarzenegger and God. But God is the Terminator, and he'll be back. Those who oppose us, resist us, hate the gospel, think we're doing all sorts of harm with our beliefs, don't really face off with us. They face off with God, a dread warrior. The Lord is with me as a dread warrior, therefore my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. Joshua, remember, embarked on battle. And as he went out, he encountered a soldier. And he says to him, are you for us or against us? No. (laughs) It's a great answer, isn't it? (laughs) No. And then the soldier flips it around says, I am the commander of the Lord's army. The issue is not whether I'm for you or against you. Are you on my side or not? Take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. A dread warrior would go before Joshua into battle. Presumably unseen by the human armies. Paul was on trial. He says in in, in 2 Timothy 4, 16, everyone abandoned me. And then he says, and my first offense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. Jesus commissioned his disciples and asked to go and make disciples of all the nations. And he said, surely I am with you. We know that promise. But this gives us a fresh spin on it, doesn't it? He is with us, not just as a gentle dove and a sweet presence. He is with us as a dread warrior. By the power of the Holy Spirit in you, you are able to be strong when you're utterly weak. You're able to do what would be impossible in your own strength. That's why Paul can say, afflicted but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. That's the first part of the prescription. Remember who God is, a dread warrior. Second then, the doc says, take your petitions to him, which is what he does in verse 12. O Lord of hosts, who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. He's calling on God to act. He knows that vengeance is the Lord's. It's for him to repay. He hands it over to God. This is not, get this, this is not a prayer against his next door neighbor who partied too late or who sprayed Roundup on his favorite tree over the fence line. This is not just sort of personal meanness. Zap them, Lord. This is... Jeremiah handing over to the dread warrior the responsibility to deal with the enemies of God. And I think that perhaps we're going to learn to pray more boldly in the years ahead. To pray for God to overcome and overthrow evil. To remove godless leaders and godless regimes. And to uphold the cause of the righteous. We should petition God with large, bold kingdom prayers. And then the third part of the 
prescription is there in verse 13. Sing to the Lord. Woo, praise. That's, that's the third thing the doc says. Praise and sing. Now, when I'm down, I don't want to. I don't feel like praising God, and I don't want to sing. It helps if Trevor's up here, but even then, I still don't want to. When I'm down, I want to brood, and I want to rant. Sometimes I'm ranting to my wife, and she tries to put a full positive spin on it and does all this God bit. <laughs> and it's like, honey, I, I just want to rant. <laughs> Ranting seldom helps. Praise does. Because praise turns us away from ourselves and how we're feeling and puts our focus back on God. And who he is, the dread warrior, and what he's doing, his justice, his righteousness, his goodness. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. Well, if only chapter 20 finished there, wouldn't it be a nice place to stop? But it isn't the end. The last part of this chapter is an absolute downer. We've seen him bold in public, grieved in private, strong in God. And now as we peek through the window of this dark, derelict little cottage again, we see him crushed in spirit. Verses 14 to 18 are incredibly dark. Are these the darkest words of the whole Bible? Maybe. Cursed be the day on which I was born. The day when my mother bore me. Let it not be blessed. Cursed be that man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you, making him very glad. Let that man be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning and an alarm at noon because he did not kill me in the womb. So my mother would have been my grave and her womb forever great. Why did I come out of the womb to see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? He doesn't say he wishes he was dead. He just wishes he'd never been born. He's very careful not to curse God or his parents, both of which would have been breaking the law. So taking a leaf out of Job's book in chapter 3, he just curses the day he was born and the poor man who made the announcement. <laughs> Don't wish Jerry a happy birthday. He wants you to sing, cursed birthday to you. <laughs> the end of uh, this chapter might remind you of Psalm 88. That's the darkest lament in the book of Psalms. The only one where there is no praise ever. The last word of the psalm is literally darkness. I don't know if you've been there. I've been low, but never this low. Maybe you have been. Maybe you're there now. Maybe you know others who are. What are we to make of the deep darkness in these verses? First, I want to suggest that there is a strange kindness of God here. I think it's a strange kindness that this didn't finish at verse 13. Because frequently our experience doesn't finish at verse 13. 
we get to verse 13 in our experience, and then the next day we feel like verse 14. We praise, and then we slump again. We rally ourselves to again be bold in public, and then we go home and we feel crushed in spirit. Philip Ryken speaks of the, quote, almost schizophrenic nature of the Christian life. One minute we praise, the next we curse. One moment we rejoice in God's plan, and the very next, he says, we resist his will. God knows that. And God can take that. Isn't it good to know that if you feel at times very dark, it does not call your faith into question. It does not throw up doubts about your spirituality. And it does not mean the end of your suitability for ministry. Some of the most godly people in the history of the church have endured deep depths of darkness. What a mercy to know that you can be a good servant of God and not always be happy and not always feel like you're living the dream. Friends, I just want you to know you can believe in God and be well qualified for gospel work and feel overwhelmed. You can know and love the gospel and feel like you can take no more. And I just love that there's no rebuke here. There's no pushback on Jeremiah. Actually, the next chapter, he gets on with it. And from chapter 11 through to chapter 20 in in the record uh, of of his experiences, there's, there's lots of these passages like this, lots of grief and anguish. After chapter 20, not a squeak. He just gets on with it. I'm not saying that Jeremiah is a model for ministry. You don't want a WWJD bracelet. What would Jeremiah do? (laughs) But he's showing reality. And God in his kindness has given us that reality. The gospel comes to us, friends, in our deepest lows and says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Our Saviour was mocked, ridiculed, more than we will ever be. His own friends turned against him, every single one of them. He was tempted early on, to, he was tempted early on to abandon his mission. The evil one came and offered him a, an easier route to glory. And Jesus resisted that infernal temptation. To bring us to glory, he was beaten. A crown of thorns was pressed down on his head. He was nailed to a cross. He knew what was coming. How painful. Old, Old Testament Bible study must have been for Jesus. Every sacrifice lamb he read of, he knew that was him. Every offering he read of, every burnt offering he read of, he knew that was him. He knew what was coming. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweated drops of blood. It says, his soul was sorrowful even to the point of death. It it almost killed him before the cross. And he petitioned God, his dread warrior, Take this cup from me. But it was the Lord's will to crush him and put him to grief, says Isaiah. 
on the cross. He quotes a different psalm of lament. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it all went dark, didn't it? Darkness over the whole land. There is no darkness greater than the darkness of the cross. That was darker than any darkness you or I have ever experienced. And yet it's from that darkness that a light shines. If we could picture our little dilapidated shack in the forest now, through that little window, a shaft of light shines in. I don't know how dark things get for you in ministry. Maybe not dark at all, and that's fine. You can just put this message on hold for another day. It'll come. But if it is dark, the cross tells you everything you need to know in your darkest day. It tells you that your Saviour knows. He knows the deepest depths of pain and anguish and despair and rejection. We find in him a suffering prophet better than Jeremiah. The one who incarnated the word more than Jeremiah did and suffered more than Jeremiah did, did for us what Jeremiah could never do. Unlike Jeremiah, he did not resent his calling but he embraced it in order that he might save many. Unlike Jeremiah, he was not spared death, but he was given over to it for our sakes and for the ransom of many, many souls. Unlike Jeremiah, he did not pray for vengeance on his enemies but prayed, Father, forgive them. And so, out of the love of Jesus for your soul, press on. Sometimes bold in public, Sometimes grieved and private. Sometimes strong in God. Sometimes crushed in spirit. Always protected by a dread warrior. Always loved by your Savior. Don't just preach the cross. Lean on it. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we would just bring to you now, uh, maybe in, in a few moments of silence, some of the dark stuff that we feel. Hear us as we pray in our hearts. Lord, in any darkness that we feel, in any despair and discouragement, in any sense of being overwhelmed or even crushed, 
shine, we pray, the light of the cross into our hearts afresh. That we might see and feel your deep love for us. That we might know that we do not have a high priest unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. And so may we approach with boldness your throne of grace again and again and find in you all that we need to do what you have called us to do. And whatever our state of mind and heart, may you be glorified and Christ be known.